Welcome to the presentation of the 2022 BIO Award. I am Linda Level, President of BIO. The 2022 BIO Award goes to Megan Marshall and will be presented by Natalie Dykstra. Megan and Natalie are both longtime members of BIO, I'm happy to say, and I'm sure many of you know them already. The BIO Award is BIO's highest honor, which we present each year to someone who has made an extraordinary contribution to biography. The 2022 recipient was selected by a committee of prestigious biographers. Kai Bird chaired the committee. Other members were Tim Dugan, Ruth Franklin, Peniel Joseph, Candace Millard, and Will Swift. Previous bio awards have gone to David Levering Lewis, Hermione Lee, James McGrath Morris, Richard Holmes, Candace Millard, Claire Tomlin, Taylor Branch, Stacy Schiff, Ron Cherno, Arnold Rampersad, Robert Cairo, and Jean Strauss. It is my pleasure now to introduce Natalie Dykstra. Natalie has been a member of the BIO Board of Directors for the past two years. She is the author of Clover Adams, A Gilded and Heartbreaking Life, and is now at work on a biography of Isabella Stewart Gardner. She has recently retired from the English department at Hope College and has received numerous fellowships, including BIO's inaugural Robert and Ina Caro Travel Research Fellowship. Natalie will introduce Megan Marshall and present her with the BIO Award. I'm very pleased to introduce my friend and mentor, Megan Marshall, as this year's recipient of the BIO Award. She is the author of three highly honored biographies. Her first, The Peabody Sisters, Three Women Who Ignited American Romanticism, won the Francis Parkman Prize and the Mark Linton History Prize, the Massachusetts Book Award in nonfiction, and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Megan's Margaret Fuller, A New American Life, won the Pulitzer Prize in biography in 2014 and the Massachusetts Book Award in nonfiction. Her latest book, part biography and part memoir, is Elizabeth Bishop, A Miracle for Breakfast. Megan has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. She was the Gilder Lehrman Fellow at the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library in 2014 and 15, and a visiting professor at Kyoto University in 2017. She teaches nonfiction writing and archival research in the MFA Creative Writing Program at Emerson College, where she is the first Charles Wellesley Emerson College professor. An elected fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society, she was the recent president of the Society of American Historians. I want to say a few words about Megan's prose and about her generosity. Virginia Woolf remarks that a good biography requires, quote, concrete and rainbow, or fact and imagination. Woolf also remarks that the virtue of fact is its almost mystic power. Like radium, she writes, it seems to give off grains of energy, atoms of light. That is what Megan's books do with such command. They give off light into past lives, into the letters and attics and poems and hearts of her subjects. But biography is a balance of fact and imagination, which is not invention, but the full use of the narrative arts, character and detail, pace and scene. Megan is a master at this too which brings her subject to life, as if a resurrection. When news was announced about Megan receiving this award, Abby Santa Maria, the biographer of Joy Gresham and now Madeline Lingle, sent a note. With Abby's permission, this is part 
of what she wrote. I want to applaud Bio for the selection of Megan as this year's award recipient. She is a national treasure. Any discussion about her contributions to the art and craft of biography would be incomplete without recognizing the generous energy and heart she devotes to nurturing younger biographers. She writes countless recommendation letters, includes us in panels, encourages and offers wise insights at just the right moments in exactly the right measures, all while treating every biographer, regardless of background, like equal colleagues. All three of Megan's books were published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, now Mariner Books, and with her brilliant editor, Deanne Ermey, who is also my editor. Long ago, when I was just starting in biography, Megan introduced me to Deanne, a great kindness which transformed what was possible for me. I am so honored to present to you, Megan, this year's Bayer Award for a writer who has done so much to shape the world of biography for readers and writers, both now and into the future. Congratulations. Thank you, Natalie, mm -hmm. so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Bio, for this deeply meaningful award. And thank you, Natalie, for that wonderful, generous introduction. I also want to thank the Massachusetts Historical Society for allowing us to film in its historic Douse Library, where some of the oldest books in the Society's collections are shelved, and directly upstairs from the reading room where I worked at becoming a biographer through the 1980s and 90s while researching the Peabody Sisters. Today, most archives and special collections libraries do all they can to welcome researchers, no matter their degrees or pedigrees. But that wasn't so true back then. The MHS was different. The staff welcomed me. A novice researcher offered me a desk where I sat with my nearly silent portable typewriter transcribing letters and diaries from the Peabody and Horace Mann papers, making my way through a tsunami of documentary evidence. I formed lifelong friendships with other researchers who passed through, like Natalie Dykstra, and with staff members, some of them still on the job today, from whom I received the education I needed to write my book. Thank you, MHS. This award is shared with you. I don't intend to preach a sermon today, but I want to take as my theme, honor the dead. If we aren't aware of living among the dead in this 22nd year of the new millennium, of our responsibility as lucky survivors, we are dead to our world. As I speak now in late April, close to one million Americans have died from COVID-19 in a little more than two years. Tens of thousands have died in Ukraine since Putin's invasion in late February. The count of black lives lost to the civil war that never ends would rightly include all those martyred in the lynchings and massacres of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, those killed slowly in poverty, those now sacrificed to police and vigilante justice. Waves of hate-inspired killings take the lives of too many from all vulnerable populations, ethnic, racial, religious, LGBTQ, school children, who may reasonably fear their vulnerability to violence will never be alleviated. We may not know what to do about this carnage, this pervasive assault on humanity, which is inseparable from humanity's assault on our living earth. But as Sunita Puri, a palliative care physician and author, wrote in a recent op-ed for the New York Times, we must learn to look at grief. We cannot turn away from death and the lessons death teaches us about living. Biographers especially cannot turn away from death. It is our work for those of us who write about past lives to revive, to immortalize, and even as we do so, to write the deaths of our subjects with compassion, accuracy, and grace. The last time I attended a bio conference, the last time any of us did in person, was in May 2019. I'd left my partner, Scott Harney, who was in the end stage of cardiac disease, the result of chemo treatments a decade before, to spend two nights in New York City. He encouraged me to make the trip. 
I was anchoring a panel that featured a trio of young biographers, and as chair of the Plutarch jury, I would confer the prize on its worthy recipient. Some of you already know that I returned home to Massachusetts to find Scott had died in his sleep. At about the same time, I handed David Blight his award in the Grad Center's auditorium. I was derailed. I spent most of a sabbatical year I'd intended to vote to a new biographical work to compiling a different next book, a volume of Scott's poetry, published one year after his death in May 2020. By then, the pandemic had taken hold. I found myself writing essays, most of them elegiac in tone. When I received the surprising and wonderful news of the Bio Award in February, I was at work on an essay I called After the First Death, There Were 19 Others, an effort to commemorate my friends, family members, and colleagues whose lives were extinguished during the intervening two years, some due to COVID, but most not. I think now I won't go back to it. Who am I to bemoan my particular losses when so many are suffering. One of the essays I completed, not yet in print, took me back to a period in my youth, which I've always inwardly sensed was formative, but I now see as determining my path in life, making me a biographer. I grew up in Pasadena, California, a city most associate with the annual Rose Bowl parade and football game, gracious shingle-style houses, trendy bungalows, and maybe if you're of a certain vintage, little old ladies. But in the 1960s, Pasadena was a locus of racial strife as members of its black community and their white allies fought for integration of the public schools. I attended a new high school with a racial balance that reflected the city's diversity. One of my classmates was John Jackson, a boy who, at 17, during the summer before our senior year, carried out a deadly plot he'd hoped would liberate his older brother, George Jackson, the famed Soledad brother, then in prison at San Quentin. Instead of successfully negotiating George's release in an exchange of hostages taken at gunpoint in a Marin County courtroom, John was killed along with three others, including a judge. The notorious Angela Davis trial ensued and George Jackson was killed in prison a year later. Back in Pasadena at our high school, John's death went unacknowledged by the administration, his presence in our class erased from the yearbook, even though another boy who died of natural causes as a high school junior was featured with a black bordered photo. When it came time for me to deliver a, salut a salutatorian's address at graduation, I wrote a speech that celebrated what I saw as John's heroism, his choice to risk death for his brother's freedom. And I was forbidden to give the speech. Nevertheless, I broke through the speaker's circle and took the podium to have my say. I wanted John's name spoken on school grounds, heard by his classmates, his still mourning friends. I'm not saying my own act was heroic. It was insignificant in the grand scheme of things. But the sense of there being a grand scheme of things, of which I was a tiny part as a witness who might testify, changed me. More fundamentally, here was death, John's death at 17. A shock to us all. A whole life had been lived alongside ours and come to an end. Was this a young life wasted? Or did John's sacrifice have meaning? I needed to think so, as did the friends who supported me in giving that speech. And I think now, the fact that the first writing I ever did for an audience met with resistance that I fought to overcome gave me an inchoate yet impelling sense of the power and purpose of language. I would be a writer and try again to be heard. I want to speak now of three ways biographers often confront death in our work of writing, the narrative choices we can make in these instances, the research dilemmas they present, and the opportunities they open to us in assessing the development of character. The first is similar to my high school experience. The important deaths in the biographies we write aren't always the deaths of our subjects. Death isn't only an ending. What of the formative losses in early years? 
I won't dwell here on the crushing experiences of orphanhood or half-orphanhood that left shadows of depression and nagging unanswered questions to plague so disparate a crew as Nathaniel Hawthorne, Elizabeth Bishop, Jane Addams, Charlie Chaplin, and Edgar Allan Poe, to list just a few names that come to mind. Instead, I'm thinking of how the death of a loved one in a subject's young adulthood can be experienced not only or even primarily as loss, but also as transformation. Here I'm going to lean a bit on the last book of my late mentor, Robert Richardson, Three Roads Back, how Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and William James responded to the greatest love losses of their lives, due out later this year. Richardson makes the case that Thoreau's grief over the death of his brother John, just a few years after they'd taken their boat trip along the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, Emerson's over the death of his first wife Ellen after little more than a year of marriage, James's over the death of his tubercular cousin Minnie, whom he and his brother Henry both had loved, proved in the end catalytic. These deaths, once faced and absorbed, became the foundations of the new philosophies each writer expounded, enabled their great work. Genius is the activity that repairs the decay of things, Emerson wrote in his essay, The Poet. Do not the flowers die every autumn? Thoreau asks, writing metaphorically in the months after his brother John's death in his arms, convulsing with lockjaw after he'd cut himself shaving. Thoreau will not let himself be saddened because these particular flowers or grasses will wither, for their death is the law of new life. Emerson and Thoreau came to believe, and then to write their remarkable books, essays, and lectures out of this belief, Richardson tells us, that at some level there is no death. The very process of decay is a life process. James's philosophy was different, but no less bound up with an early acquired openness to the lessons of mortality. Death sits at the heart of each one of us, William James wrote, enabling us to gather the resources within ourselves to keep up a true and courageous spirit. Go to meet it, work it to our ends. Death can work for humans the way Thoreau said it did for nature, to reseed, regenerate our lives. This happened for Margaret Fuller at age 25 with the sudden death of her father. Brilliant, but marooned on the family farm in Groton, Massachusetts, mending clothes, running a home school for her younger siblings, Fuller might never have found a way to break free of family obligations under her domineering father's influence. With his death from Asiatic cholera, contracted while working the farm's marshy fields, those same obligations became enormous. He'd left his family with almost nothing, and she was the eldest. A few months after his death, she returned from a night watching at the bedside of an ailing neighbor and lay down in what had been her father's deathbed, waking to broad sunlight and a conviction that she would become father to her large family. Not only did she step, step into his role, she remade that role to support her previously frustrated ambitions, becoming a writer, journalist, instigator of a new women's movement, and more. All this time, she carried on a relationship with her departed father, creating an idealized Timothy Fuller, with whom she conversed in her imagination. Sometimes she questioned his decision to move the family to the countryside, leading to his death and her mounting cares. Other times, she believed he blessed her. We know this phenomenon from our own lives, our own losses, the way it's possible to draw the absent loved one into our own ongoing selves. We can write it into our biographies. Margaret Fuller died at 40 in a shipwreck. Sylvia Plath and Clover Adams died too soon as suicides. Amelia Earhart crashed somewhere in her airplane. Tragic early deaths can make our subjects popular, but they confound the biographer. They cut short the cradle-to-grave plot that, in truth, many of us resist anyway. But how is the biographer of a subject who is best known for her death to focus the reader's attention on the life? Two of my favorite books in this genre, Natalie Dykstra's Clover Adams, A Gilded and Heartbreaking Life, and Carol Bundy's The Nature of Sacrifice, 
a biography of Charles Russell Lowell Jr. open with their subjects' deaths, or in Lowell's case, his elaborate funeral at the close of the Civil War. I should note that some biographers of long-lived subjects make the same choice, though for different reasons. I'm thinking of Justin Kaplan's path-breaking Walt Whitman, A Life. Dykstra gives us the details outright in the prologue of her book, speaking to what any knowing reader would have in the back of her mind, and avoiding subterfuge for those who don't already know Clover Adams, the wife of the eminent historian Henry Adams, with whom she hosted the most brilliant salon in Washington, D.C. Clover had taken up the new art of photography as she neared her 40th birthday. Here's how Dykstra tells it. But just when Clover discovered a powerful way to express herself, her life started to unravel. What had been a recurrent undertow of dark moods gathered force until she was engulfed by despair, pulled down in the words of a friend, as if by some unseen tide. On a gloomy Sunday morning in early December of 1885, two and a half years after she had first picked up her camera, Clover committed suicide by drinking from a vial of potassium cyanide which she had used to develop her photographs. The means of her art had become the means of her death, a weapon she used against herself. The most dramatic moment of her life also became its most defining cocooning her memory in the hush-hush of familial shame and confusion. When she was remembered at all, it was most often as the wife of a famous man or as a suicide. So Dykstra has laid out her narrative challenge with eloquence and transparency, and in so doing, she allows herself to get on with the life story and then return to the death with nuance at the book's close and in a different spirit deftly counteracting the preconception she addresses at the outset. Carol Bundy's choice to lead with her subject's death was made for different reasons. At the time she was writing The Nature of Sacrifice in the 1990s and early 2000s, few remembered Charles Russell Lowell Jr., a Union colonel who gave his life at age 29 at Cedar Creek in one of the last battles of the war. His wife of one year, Josephine Shaw Lowell, would live another 40 years to earn a more lasting reputation as a social welfare reformer in New York City. The fountain in Bryant Park honors her to this day. For Bundy, staging and peopling the grand funeral service and procession of December 1864 was key to establishing Lowell's significance. Over the course of a dozen riveting pages, she makes us see how, of all the many deaths of young Massachusetts soldiers in the war, including four of Charlie Lowell's cousins, and even his famous brother-in-law, Robert Gould Shaw, the mourning for Lowell was outsized, unprecedented. Never within your knowledge or mine, one observer wrote to a friend, has such a funeral as this been seen. Into her telling of this pageant, Bundy tucks an account of her subject's final moments. This was a man who in the Shenandoah Valley campaign alone had had 13 horses shot from under him, a man whom in three and a half years of battle no bullet had touched. And so when the spent Minier bullet hit him high in the chest, knocking him from his horse and reducing his voice to a whisper, he had refused to leave the field. At the summons to attack, he had been strapped back into his saddle, and with sword drawn, he had led the charge, his red officer's sash making him an irresistible target for the rebel sharpshooters on the rooftops of Middletown. When he was shot the second time, the bullet passed from shoulder to shoulder, severing his spinal cord. Thus, he had received his fatal wounds. We do like to write deaths, don't we? Does finding the words to describe the ineffable moment to adopt a 19th century euphemism for death that has always sounded pretty great to me give us a fleeting sense that we might also control our own fates? Maybe. But more than that, I think narrating the death scene, wherever we place it, releases the pent-up identification and sympathy we've brought to bear on our project, held in check through so many years of work. Often, our job is nearly done, and we're saying goodbye, too. My third case. We're writing the death of a long-lived subject. We're at the end of the book. How do we get it right? 
And if we're writing about a subject whose life story has been told many times over, how do we make our version new? As someone once said decades back when a plagiarism charge was in the air, there are only so many ways to write Lincoln's assassination. In her 1993 book, Elizabeth Bishop, Life and the Memory of It, Bishop's first biographer, Brett Millier, prefaced her terse account of the poet's final hour with a quotation from a letter Bishop had written the morning of her death, scolding an anthologist for wishing to footnote certain words in one of her poems in a college edition he planned. If a poem catches a student's interest at all, he or she should damn well be able to look up an unfamiliar word in the dictionary, Bishop wrote. Four lines and a page turn later, we read, at about six o'clock on that Saturday afternoon, Elizabeth Bishop died quickly and painlessly of a cerebral aneurysm. Alice, her romantic partner, Alice Methvessel, found her there, the telephone off the hook beside her when she arrived to take her to dinner at Helen Vendler's. But then, in the oral biography, Remembering Elizabeth Bishop, published one year later in 1994, I read, on 6 October 1979, Bishop died in her, in her apartment from a cerebral aneurysm while she was dressing for dinner at Helen Vendler's. Meth Vessel found her on the floor in her bedroom when she came to Lewis Wharf to pick her up. Perhaps there was no contradiction, just different information in the two accounts, telephone off the hook in one, fallen to the floor in the other, with its absence of physical detail, though, Millier's version left a different impression, really no impression, except perhaps that of an unanswered or never placed call for help. I had to be sure of the circumstances, and fortunately I was able to consult Bishop's friend, the poet Frank Bedart, who had rushed over from the dinner at Helen Vendler's to aid Alice Methvessel. Bedart provided more details. Elizabeth had been on the floor only partially clothed. I think now Millier wanted to conceal this indignity, just as she had, through her entire book, written in a less LGBT-friendly era, shied from commenting on Elizabeth's sexuality. I won't read my version, but I was able to write with confidence after consulting a first-hand witness. That's not always possible. I'm going to close with three different, very brief, accounts of Henry David Thoreau's death. Yes, Thoreau died young at 44, but his was not one of those short lives overshadowed or seemingly defined by his early death from tuberculosis. And perhaps because of his prodigious output, the enduring classics, Walden and Civil Disobedience, as well as the two million words of his journals, all in print, no biographer ever thought to open a book with his dying, which makes a fitting final scene. Thoreau's was one of those good deaths of the 19th century, attended by close family members with last words witnessed and recorded. But what were they? I know you've heard a lot of words already in this speech, so listen here for restless, hyacinths, raised up, moose, Indian, and now comes good sailing. First, from what was for decades the standard biography, Walter Harding's 1962, The Days of Henry Thoreau. At seven o'clock, he became restless and asked to be moved. Judge Rockwood Hoare arrived with a bouquet of hyacinths from his garden. Thoreau smelled them and said he liked them. His self-possession did not forsake him. A little after eight, he asked to be raised up. The last few weeks of his life, he had been working over his Maine Woods papers, and his thoughts continued on his writing to the end. The last sentence he spoke contained but two distinct words, moose and Indian. As his mother, his sister, and his Aunt Louisa watched, his breathing grew fainter and fainter, and without the slightest struggle, he died at nine o'clock, May 6. Sophia said, I feel as if something very beautiful had happened not death. Now from Laura Dassow Walls's Henry David Thoreau, A Life, published in 2017, the bicentennial of Thoreau's birth. At 7 a.m. Tuesday morning, May 6, Judge Hoare called from across the street with a spring bouquet of hyacinths, 
which Henry smelled and liked. He began to grow restless, and at eight he asked to be raised sitting up. Sophia, Cynthia, and Aunt Louisa all watched as his breath grew faint, then fainter, until at nine o'clock in the morning he was still. Her brother's mind was clear to the last, said Sophia, as she read to him from his river voyage with John. She heard him say, now comes good sailing. I hadn't read those two accounts side by side until preparing for this speech, and at first I was a bit rattled by their similarity. But then similarity is inevitable when working from the same few sources. And I noticed Walls had omitted what Harding gave as Thoreau's last words, the barely audible moose and Indian, and replaced them with now comes good sailing. A better line? Walls had the benefit of a 2016 article by Kathy Fedorko revisiting Henry's last words, published in the Thoreau Society Bulletin, which Walls cites in her endnotes. Fedorko sorted through the various contemporaneous accounts and found that only Sophia Thoreau's letter, written to a mutual friend shortly after her brother's death, could be trusted. Sophia had been there. In her letter is where we find restless, raised quite up, fainter and fainter, but she offers no last words. An early biographer, Thoreau's friend, Ellery Channing, is the source for the barely audible moose and Indian, but Fedorko posits that Channing had supplied the last words he'd heard from Thoreau's lips on his own last visit two days before his friend died. And then there are two copies of Thoreau's book, A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, belonging to friends of the Thoreau family, in which the owners underlined the words, now comes good sailing, in Thoreau's text and noted in the margin, Henry, to his sister while reading this to him just before he breathed his last, and in the other case, Henry to his sister when she read this to him when near his end. Well, make of this what you will. Here's how Bob Richardson handled those last moments without the benefit of Fedorko's article in his 1986 Henry Thoreau, A Life of the Mind. Richardson's book was an intellectual biography, so he's packed some of the biographical material that the other two writers spaced out through their final chapters into these two paragraphs that conclude his book. Thoreau's last days were spent at home in peace, surrounded by family and friends. His bed was brought downstairs. No longer able to write, he dictated to Sophia. By early April, his voice had been only a faint whisper for many weeks, but his mind, wit, and spirits held. He advised Emerson's son, Edward, who was about to take a trip to the Rocky Mountains before going back to college, to carry an arrowhead so as to learn from Indians the secret of making them. Sam Staples, Thoreau's one-time jailer, thought he had never seen a man dying with so much pleasure and peace. To his Aunt Louisa, who asked if he had made his peace with God, he answered, I did not know we had ever quarreled, Aunt. His last words came back to his writing. Early in the morning on May 6, Sophia read him a piece from the Thursday section of a week, and Thoreau anticipated with relish the Friday trip homeward, murmuring, now comes good sailing. In his last sentence, only the two words, moose and Indian, were audible. No more satisfying deathbed utterance can be imagined for Thoreau than his reply to a question put gently to him by Parker Pillsbury a few days before his death. You seem so near the brink of the dark river, Pillsbury said, that I almost wonder how the opposite shore may appear to you. Thoreau's answer summed up his life. One world at a time, he said. What I admire most here is Richardson's deft sleight of hand in finding a way to offer the words of Thoreau's that he wanted to end with. No more satisfying deathbed utterance can be imagined for Thoreau then. He's not fabricating or dissembling, but he gets us to a new and maybe the best ending. One world at a time. Remarkably, though, none of these three biographers used the sentence in Sophia Thoreau's letter that strikes me as most poignant and most apt for Thoreau. 
He wishes his bed was in the form of a shell, Sophia wrote, that he might curl up in it. I could leave you with a few quick thoughts on a fourth question. How do we grant our subjects an afterlife, address their legacy? Of course, our books themselves attempt to do this. In his Plutarch-winning biography of Frederick Douglass, David Blight states the matter bluntly in his final pages. But Douglass was not gone. He was merely dead. Nell Painter gives a full chapter and a lengthy coda to legacy in her biography, Sojourner Truth, A Life, A Symbol. Susan Ware devotes a whole book to tracking an ambiguous legacy in her Still Missing, Amelia Earhart and the Search for Modern Feminism. A friend of mine who reads mostly novels once told me she didn't like reading biographies. I know how they're going to end. That's the narrative problem we're all up against, and I hope I've given you enough examples today to brush aside my friend's prejudice against the genre, not that any of you would share it. Speaking of Amelia Earhart, I can't tell you the stress I felt recently when my five-year-old granddaughter handed me a picture book biography of Amelia Earhart and asked me to read it aloud to her. How would the writer end this one? Would I have to explain death to my granddaughter? As her 40th birthday approached, Amelia decided she wanted one final challenge, to fly around the world. A brave navigator went with her. They flew for thousands of miles over oceans and jungles and over the savanna where giraffes turned their heads in their trail. Some people said the journey was crazy, but Amelia wasn't afraid of living a thousand adventures. So she flew on like a bird farther than anyone had gone before, dot, 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 never to return. The illustration shows a tiny airplane soaring up toward the top right corner of the page. Did this book fail my granddaughter in its evasion? Did I, in not telling her what I knew after closing the book, because I didn't, my own fascination with the genre of biography began around the time I was old enough to read chapter books, including one on Earhart, which didn't fudge the details so, fl so flagrantly. It was the mystery of her absence, along with the certainty of her death, that drew me to nonfiction, to real lives. What could we find out about what really happened? Life had its own mysteries, not just novels, which I also loved to read. And my work as a biographer prepared me for the mysteries in my own life, such as the night I returned home to find my beloved Scott curled up in bed, no longer breathing. What had his last hours been like? On the train to New York two days before, I'd texted him that I'd like a copy of my friend Susan Ware's new group biography, Why They Marched, untold stories of the women who fought for the right to vote for my upcoming birthday. The book was on the bureau beside him. Until I received the bio award, I had thought I might never come back to a bio conference. The experience in 2019 was too much. But in writing this speech, confronting in yet another way that death, I'm reminded that I'd been there in 2019 because Scott wanted me to go. He wanted me to continue my work despite his illness. And so, to honor his choice back then, I promise you that I will attend every future bioconference I can. I hope to see all of you there in 2023 and beyond. Thank you.